All right, it looks like everyone's coming in from the waiting room. Welcome to our cruel embroidery class. Darren is there on screen. He's gonna be your teacher today. And I'm Samantha. I'll be hanging out in the chat, ready to answer questions there and I'll forward them on to Darren as well. Just a reminder, this class is going to be recorded. So if you need to stop and rewatch, you can do that tomorrow on michaels.com slash classes or on YouTube. And with that, I'm gonna go ahead and let Darren take it away. All right, welcome to class. Today we're gonna, it's just an introduction to some basic embroidery techniques and stitches. So um, let's go ahead and get started. If we wanna change the camera view to the view of my hands. So that way, set. All right, so let's talk a little bit about some of the supplies you're gonna need and some things that um, will help make it easier for you to get started. The fabric that you wanna use, you wanna use, usually a woven fabric is nice, something that isn't, um, and you don't want anything stretchy. So you can really do embroidery on any fabric at all. Um, once you get a little bit of practice in. But for learning, especially, you don't wanna use anything that's stretchy and you don't wanna use anything that's woven like super tight so that it's hard to pull the, the yarn or the thread through the fabric. So a nice woven like linen or cotton, something like that is very nice. Something like a denim would be maybe a little bit um, tight, too tightly woven for practicing. Um, and then once you get, um, your feel for it, then you can start expanding and trying some different things. But for learning, we definitely recommend a nice linen or cotton, something that's woven um, fairly, like a good, a sturdy weave, but something that is not woven too tight. Um, you're gonna also need an embroidery hoop and you wanna try to get one, um, they do come in different qualities and they're not very expensive, but you do wanna try to get one that lines up really nicely um, sometimes this center ring isn't, um, sometimes they don't fit together real well. So you do want to try to get one that's, that lines up nicely. Um, michaels.com has them, so you can order them quite easily. They come in different shapes. You can get oval ones or, or different size ones. So whatever you're looking for. Um, and to put this on your fabric, you just put the solid ring on the inside on the underside, and then you pop this one with the hinge on top of it, and then you tighten the screw down until it's pretty tight, and you do wanna kinda pull your fabric to make it um, so that it's in there nice and stretched. You don't wanna stretch it too much to where you're distorting it, but you wanna pull it in there nice and even so that it's um, kind of like a drum, like you want it to be a little tight, but again, not nothing too extreme. All right, and then different types of needles you can use. Um, I like a needle that's called a chenille needle, which is a, grab one here to show you. Um, a chenille needle has a sharp tip, so it is sharp, um, but it also has a larger eye, so it is easy to put the yarn through it. So for cruel embroidery, it is nice to have a sharper tip um, and an eye that's large enough to put your yarn through. So you can use different types of needles as well. Um, you might uh, find one that you like a little bit better. So experiment with different needles and different needle sizes. Um, the needle size is gonna depend on the type of yarn or, or thread that you're using. So if you're using a very big, Yarn, of course, you'll want a larger needle. So that's, that's pretty, um, pretty simple. So you've got your needle. Um, any type of yarn is really good for um, cool embroidery. It's a nice way to use up your old scraps and odds and ends. So a lot of what I'm gonna be using today is, um, I'm gonna be using this Heartland yarn in different colors and then some just scrap yarn that I have. And this is available on michaels.com as well or on lionbrand.com. This is a Lion brand yarn. It's an acrylic and it's worsted weight. Um, you can use worsted weight, DK weight, sport or sock weight. You can even use chunky or super chunky, uh, depending on the look that you want. Um, 
you can use all these different ones in different in the same project to make it look different in different places. And you could use really fuzzy yarn if you wanted to have a maybe like a fuzzy white yarn to make clouds, or if you're making an animal, you know, you could really get creative with the textures and the thicknesses of yarn. So don't let anything limit you with that. And then from after you've worked for a while, maybe you've made a mistake. Um, taking out your work once you've put it in, you want either um, like a seam ripper like this because you can really get under just the, the thread you wanna remove. And then it has a little blade in there that'll cut it. So you're not so likely to cut your fabric. You don't wanna put a hole in your fabric if you can avoid that. Um, also, you can use a little pair of embroidery scissors, the same, same thing for snipping your thread. And then also, if you wanna get in there and, and cut something and take it out. Um, sometimes it's nice to have a pair of pliers to pull your needles through. Um, if you're working with a thick yarn or a tight, um, tightly woven fabric, Sometimes this will help pull the needle through. So you don't always need that, but it's nice to kind of have it on hand in case if you do. Um, a little ruler or a tape measure can sometimes be handy. And then these pens come in very, very handy. This one is a disappearing ink and it disappears with water when it gets wet. And so what you can do is you can draw your design directly on to your fabric. So if you wanted to, to draw flowers or whatever you're gonna be making, um, you can draw this directly on. And also this one is a heat transfer pencil. And what you can do with this one is if you find a design that you like, you can um, print it out and then you can trace it with this um, heat transfer pencil. So you can print out a nice little design, a little, little drawing, um, go over it very, very nice with this pencil. And then you can iron that directly on. You've basically made an iron on transfer and you can iron that directly onto your fabric. So I drew quickly earlier this afternoon, I did, did this little cat. And then when I ironed it on to this piece of fabric, now I have this to work from. So you can trace it. Um, and then iron it onto your fabric. And that's a good way of getting your design onto your fabric. So if you don't wanna draw it freehand, um, that's a good way. There are other ways you can use transfer papers. Um, you can print um, designs directly onto a transfer paper and then iron it onto your um, work the same way. So there's lots of different ways of getting your design onto your fabric. Okay, so any questions about anything we've covered about the supplies. Um, so uh, I like, okay, go ahead. Yes, Nancy had a question. Um, she wanted to know what size hoop you're using and what size hoop you would recommend for beginners getting started with embroidery. Um, this hoop's about eight inches. Um, the size of the hoop I don't think really matters so much as long as it's a nice sturdy hoop and it stays on your fabric nicely. Um, probably one that's big enough. You don't want to use something that's super tiny. You do want to have enough room to work in it, but you know, just something that's comfortable to hold in your hand, but yet big enough that you can have space to work. Um, I don't think the size is going to be a huge problem for you. You don't want to get a great big one and, and something that's too un unwielding um, to try to balance in your hand while you're learning though. I think that might be the only problem. Um, and then I like to put my, sometimes I'll put my yarn on these little bobbins um, just to have it handy. So that's pretty much the supplies that you need. Um, thimbles, it's nice to have a thimble. I have this thimble here. And then I bought some, some fancy thimbles off of eBay because I like to have like pretty things when I'm working. I think that's part of the, the joy of making stuff is having nice, um, nice pretty things to work with. Um, but pretty much basically the supplies you need are gonna be things you probably already have around the house anyway, if you do any type of sewing or are very easily to, easy to get, like nothing is, is that unusual. Okay, so any questions about anything of that? Yeah, there were a couple of questions about cruel needle, needles. Is there a specific type of needle? Um, can you give a little bit more detail on that? So for the cruel needle, the recommended needle is the um, chenille needle because it has the larger eye and it has a nice point to go through. Um, 
you can use any needle that you want though. You can use, depending on the stitch is also part of it. If you're doing like French knots, you might want to use a millinery needle because then the eye and the needle are the same size so it's easier to go through. But I really like the chenille needle. That's the, that's the one that I like. Great, I think that's pretty much it for right now. Okay, all right, so let's try to get started with some stitches and the stitches we're gonna to cover today are pretty basic so that you can just practice and kind of get the hang of it. So um, I'm starting mine right now with a knot. So there's different ways of starting your work. Um, sometimes people don't like to use a knot. I think for beginners though, a knot is a good option. And I'm gonna start it this way and then I'll show you later on how you can start it if you don't wanna use a knot. So the first thing I'm gonna do though, which also makes it a little bit easier, um, I'm gonna draw a straight line and then I can use that line as a guide so I can keep my, my lines going straight. So I'm gonna draw it right on my fabric with this purple pen. And I'm just using a nice linen, just anything that's not stretchy, a linen, a cotton, something woven. And then this pen will, it'll disappear. So if it gets wet, it'll disappear. So it's not going to uh, show through. But the good thing about with working with the yarn and with cruel embroidery is that if, even if you drew on here with like a, a ballpoint pen, your um, stitches are gonna be big enough that they'll cover that. So if you don't have a, a disappearing pen, um, you know, it's not such a huge deal because with this type of work, the stitches are large enough that they will cover it. I mean, don't draw with a Sharpie because that's a pretty thick line, but you know, if you do a ballpoint pen, you know, pretty much you can make anything work that you need to work. So I'm just gonna, from the back of my work, I'm gonna take a stitch, I'm gonna come up. And so this is a running stitch or a basting stitch. So this is a pretty basic stitch for any type of sewing. And the one thing you wanna do is you wanna make sure you're trying to keep your stitches spaced out the same distance. And here's a little um, way you can cheat by doing that. So if you measure on your thumb, and I'm gonna go ahead and just put a couple of lines on my thumb. So there's a fourth inch, there's a half inch, and then there's a full inch measure. So this is how cheaters do it. So that way it'll help me um, as a beginner, you know, you want to have any kind of trick, any kind of trick or tip that might help you keep things a little bit easier. So with the basting stitch, you are just, you come up and then you go back down, take it from the bottom. You don't want to pull it tight. You don't want to distort your fabric or cause it to buckle. And so with the basting stitch, you have two things you're looking at. You have the actual stitch that you're making, and then you have the space between your stitches. And you can decide if you want the stitches and the spaces to be the same distance apart, or maybe the stitch will be longer than the, um, than the space. So in my situation here, I'm gonna do, um, the stitch is actually gonna be a little bit longer than the space. So I'm gonna redraw that cheater mark to show you how to do that. I'm gonna do it on my finger. Okay, so you can just kind of lay that out. I'm gonna go back down. And so you're just going up and down and basically making a line that's shaped kind of like a dash. So I'm not being super careful, um, but you can see the, um, you've got your stitch and then the space that's in between the stitch. And then another way to do it is you can do it like this so that you're not really ever taking your work, your needle clear to the back. And 
And once you get a little bit of practice in, it's not, it's a little, gets a little easier to keep the stitches the same shape and the same distance. Okay, so this is pretty much probably the most basic stitch that you're gonna use. And I personally don't think it's a, I mean, it's, it's pretty useful. It's not the most beautiful stitch, but I'm gonna show you some ways to kind of decorate it up and make it look a little nicer. I do like my guidelines. If you want a straight line though, I do recommend using a line. And so this one, I'm gonna do a little different on this side. Let's so see how you can take a couple of stitches all at once on your needle like this. So now that I've got, I've got two lines of it right next to each other. I'm gonna pull my fabric a little tighter again. So let me show you what you can do to kind of decorate this and make it a little bit more fun now that we've got this basic line in. So you can either leave it like this if you don't wanna do anything else to it, that's fine. But so I've taken this black yarn and I've brought it up from the back and now I'm not going to actually pierce my fabric anymore with this line. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to kind of weave it in and out of my basting stitch. And so this is called a whipped basting stitch, a whipped running stitch. So I'm just kind of whipping it through. And that gives it a nice kind of decorative look. So you see how that kind of really kind of dresses it up a little bit. And then another thing you can do is if you have two of them right in a row like this, you can weave them together and kind of make a, a zigzag through them. So you can see how that could be a nice way to decorate. So if you had a border, if you were doing a border or maybe something along the base or the bottom of something, or if you were doing lettering, this could be like the beginning of a fancy letter. Like if you're doing like somebody's monogram or initials, this could be like the start of a letter or something like this. And then you could turn it into like a, a B or, or something, some such thing. So that is a basic, that's a running stitch, but then there are a couple of ways to embellish that to make it look a little bit more interesting. So just by knowing this one basic stitch, then there's three different versions of it you can do to make it more interesting. Is that, is that anyone have any questions about that one? That's great. Um, there were a couple of questions. Elizabeth would like to know if you can speak to why some people don't knot at the beginning or end of their, or at the end of their yarn. Well, I'm not, I'm, I mean, technically, and this is the same in like knitting and crocheting as well, knots really aren't the best practice because knots can come untied. And once they come untied, then your work can unravel. So once you've become a little bit more experienced, then you know, you might not want to use knots. So this one, this one doesn't have a knot at the end. So I'm going to bring this one up. So now I'm going to show you a new stitch. I'm going to show you, um, let's do the back stitch. I really like the back stitch. It comes in really handy. So I'm going to do the back stitch and then I'll show you how to secure it without a knot. So I'm going to be careful not to pull the whole thing through. So I'm basically just gonna take a little stitch and so now I've got my work on the inside, I've got my tail. So I'm gonna kind of secure it around that, um, instead of, um, I'm gonna make sure when I go back and take my second stitch that I loop my yarn around that tail. 
And I'm going to try to do that a couple of times to make sure I'm securing it that way. So for a back stitch, it kind of starts out like the running stitch. But then instead of going forward, I'm going to go back. And so that's why it's called the back stitch. I'm going to try to catch that tail under my stitches as I go. And then that will secure it. And that will secure it and it won't come undone. And you don't have to worry about the knots coming untied later on. So either way, but as beginners, I think it's okay to tie knots and be careful and just make sure you're tying them securely because it's, um, it's a little easier to get started. And you, know, you don't want to have to worry about trying to do anything too complicated at first. So sometimes for beginners, I think it's all right. And so for the back stitch, you can see it's really easy to do different um, shapes. So I'm kind of going in like a little wavy line here. So it makes it nice if you're doing a flower stem or a vine, or if you're, you're writing something. So for the back stitch, you just come up ahead about a, the same length the stitches are. You have that space here. So you have this space here that's about the same distance as the stitches that you're making. You bring it up and then you go back down through the same hole as previously the one came up. So you're going back down through the same one. And this is a really nice stitch to have, even if you're sewing, um, doing hand sewing and repairing something or sewing a seam um, you can use the back stitch. It's not just an embroidery stitch. It's a very handy stitch to have in your pocket. But for embroidery, it's nice because you can kind of go in any direction. So you can kind of stop, progress, and we'll do a different direction at any time. Any questions about the back stitch? You're able to see how that looks. There are no questions about the back stitch, but Barr did want to know approximately how long should your yarn be before it gets to be a little bit of a problem. I'm um, usually for sewing and it's a pretty standard rule like they recommend that the yarn or the thread you're using be about as long as your arm. Um, I'm not sure how that works if people have really long arms or really short arms because I know people are like different sizes, but that's the kind of the rule of thumb. Just kind of keep it about as long as your arm, like an arm, good arm length of it. But if you do find yourself that the yarn is getting tangled or it's like too much for you to work with, just go ahead and use a little bit of a shorter piece. And then once you find that you're able to, um, to use a longer piece, then that'll be fine. You can just keep making it a little bit longer until it becomes a problem. It's nice if you can have a long piece because then you don't have to stop and rejoin. So if you can get used to using a longer piece, then um, that makes it easier in the long run. So, so that's the back stitch. Oh, and before we move on, Bar would like you to demonstrate the back stitch just a little bit more. Okay. So you take a stitch, you come up, and then you pull your yarn through. And then you go back through the hole to kind of fill in this space. And then you take another stitch in whichever direction. The back stitch is nice because you really can go in any, any direction. You can change directions. And then instead of progressing with the stitch, you go back and join it to the stitch that's right behind it. Okay. And then see, you can even, this is why it's nice for like a vine or something, because you can, you know, kind of branch off in different directions as well. You don't have to keep filling in the same. And we do have a question from Catherine who wants to know how much she should care about what the back side of this fabric is looking like as she's making. Well, um, 
as a beginner, I would say, try to keep it as neat as possible. Um, you do want it to be, you know, you want it to be as neat as possible to make things easier for you. But um, technically my great grandmother always said that the back of the fabric should look as nice as the front of the fabric. So um, there's that opinion. Um, and, but as I mean, beginners, I think beginners should be cut a lot of slack. You want to learn without any kind of stress or anxiety. Um, the problem is, is like you don't want, so say I'm, I'm doing a design here in this cream color, and then for my design, I want to jump over here and do another piece, um, a little design or something in a cream color over here. Um, so I do it like that. I mean, technically that's not a good practice because what that does is it gives me this long stretch in the back. Gives me this. Um, and the problem with that is, is it doesn't look very nice and that could get caught on something. And if that gets caught on something and yanked, then you can see what happens in the front. It pulls the stitches tight in the front and it can pucker your fabric. So it's not only that it, might not look as nice on the back, but you don't want all of those um, strings stringing across the back because they could cause a snag. Now, if you're gonna make something like a, like a bag and you're gonna be putting stuff in and out of it, that could be more of a concern or if you're doing this on a sweater or a shirt. But if you're making a piece that's gonna be framed and hung on the wall, you know, maybe it's not a problem at all. But if your great grandmother ever takes that down and takes the back off of it, then you might be in trouble. So there's, there's always that risk. So anything, any other questions? Nope. Nope. Uh, yeah. Okay. So let's now I'm going to switch to the um, split stitch. And the split stitch is similar to the back stitch. I'm going to come back over here and rejoin to here. Um, gives a different texture though. So I'm going to do a back stitch. I'm going to, is it better without this light that's too dark? Because it was causing a lot of shadows. I'm not sure. I thought it might be better, but it seemed like it was causing shadows. I feel like I need that. Sorry. I hope it's, the shadows aren't too bad. All right. So the back stitch. We jump back like here. Now the split stitch, um, you take a slightly shorter stitch. So you do a slightly shorter stitch. And then you, instead of coming into that same hole, what you're going to do is you're going to go, you're going to split this previous stitch. So you're going to go down through it. What I'm going to do is I'm actually going to switch yarn. I really didn't mean to pick up this yarn that was so light. So let me go ahead and switch yarns. So see, I'm going through the previous stitch. I'm splitting it. And that gives you a little bit more of a texture. And this one's also nice because you can go in any direction. You can make curved lines. You can make straight lines. You can, um, it's good for writing, it's good for letters. You see how it kind of, so you're going right through here. So the back stitch, you would have gone right here, but for the split stitch, you're going through here and you're splitting it. Any questions about the split stitch? Nope, but I just wanna remind everyone that there is a handout for this class and I just added it to the chat if you guys are looking for it. So that is the split stitch. All right, another good one, and this one's called the chain stitch. And so the chain stitch is you take a stitch here, and then you go under 
So you're not really going through the fabric, you're just going under that stitch like this. And then you go back down. I use the chain stitch a lot. I don't use the split stitch very often. I like the back stitch and I like the chain stitch. Um, they just, the movement just seems to be a little faster. Um, the back stitch to me doesn't, I'd rather do the chain stitch. I think the chain stitch gives you more of a texture, but as you practice, you'll find the stitches that you really like. But you see how this chain stitch, it really kind of gives you like this braided line, almost looks braided or like a, Can you guys see how that's working? And this one's a really good one as well to go. You can go in any shape. You can go in any, you can do a circle or curly lines or, it seems like most of the things when I'm doing don't really have a lot of straight lines, so. How do we like the chain stitch? Do we like that? We love it. Um, they did notice that your yarn has doubled. So can you talk about um, why it went from a single strand of yarn to two? I think it was already doubled, but with this okay. stitch, it was just pulling it tighter. Okay. Um, I'm not sure, maybe, you know what? I think I probably just, instead of pulling it all the way through, I kind of let it double back on itself. Oh. Uh, but that's a good point. I do like a doubled yarn sometimes because it really can change the effect, especially if you're doing some type of a drawing. Um, sometimes it's nice to have a nice thick line. Sometimes it's nice to have a thin line. So you can double your yarn or keep it single. Um, I th think you're right. I think this did start out as a single, but then I just kind of let it go back on itself. Where it, So you might want to be careful not let that happen, or maybe it's fine. I kind of like how it started out thin and got thicker, though. So that would be... You know, if we were really doing a design, you know, that might, maybe that would be a mistake or maybe that would be something that would be, you know, something we'd want to try. But for the chain stitch, let me end this and I'll start it again so you can see how it starts. So I'm just going to start it over here, a new place. Okay. So you just take a stitch. So just make like a straight stitch, like if you're gonna start the basting stitch or anything else. And then you kind of come up a little bit in advance from it, a little bit ahead of it. And you're not piercing the fabric at this point, you're sliding under that stitch. So you're just kind of sliding under that stitch. And then you're going back down through the same place that you came up. And then you come up ahead of that. You wanna to try to keep your stitches spaced out the same distance as possible. So you come up, bring your needle to the front, and then you're gonna slide under. You're not piercing your fabric, you're sliding it under. And you wanna pull it snug, but you don't wanna pull it too tight. And then you're going back down through the same, the exact same place that you came up or maybe one thread over it. It's not gonna be a crisis either way. Okay. And then you can go in a straight line or you can go any direction you want. Okay, does that make sense? Any questions about that? Okay, let's see the split stitch. So the split stitch is different. So if I were gonna do a split stitch, they do look similar. So let me take another stitch over here. Okay, so there's like a starting stitch. So the split stitch, you, you come up ahead of that stitch. And so for the chain stitch, you would go under, but for the split stitch, you are piercing the fabric and you're going down. 
but when you pierce the fabric, you're going through the center of that stitch. Okay, so that's the difference between a split stitch and the chain stitch. So it kind of starts out the same. So you bring your needle up, and at this point, I could do a chain stitch or a back stitch or a split stitch. So the split stitch splits the previous stitch. Okay. Any other questions? Um, there was a question. What would be the benefit of using the chain stitch as opposed to the blitz, the split stitch aside from aesthetics? That's it. It's really, it's the way that it looks. Um, it just gives a different texture and a different appearance so that if you are, um, you know, if you're doing a, a bouquet of flowers, you might, some of the stems you might want to do in one and the other, you might do a vine and a chain stitch, it's a little thicker. You might want to do like a like a more delicate leaf or something. You might want to outline it with the split stitch. It just depends on the texture that you're looking for. Um, most of these stitches, you're not really looking for the strength of the stitch, like you would be looking like if you were sewing a garment. It's really just the, the way they look and the aesthetic and how pretty they are and how they kind of look next to each other. So pretty much, that would be the, the way you, know, you would decide which one you're going to use, depending on how you want it to look. Okay. Any other, anything else? Get a fresh spot on this little bag. Any other questions? Nope. Okay. All right. So chain stitch. So let's look now at a French knot. So the French knot that gives you a really nice little textured stitch. And so with this one, I'm using a hand dyed yarn that I have. I just happen to have this hand dyed one available. And it is um, kind of a pink and purple. And I, sometimes when you have a hand dyed yarn with doing embroidery, it can really add a lot to your work, especially if you're doing something that might um, like look like a flower or something, it kind of gives it a little bit extra dimension. So I like to have a hand dyed or a, like a variegated yarn. If it doesn't have to be hand dyed, it could be like a variegated one or something. Okay, so a French knot. So you bring it up. And then you wrap around the needle twice. And then you wanna go back down right, not in the same hole, but like one or two threads right over from that hole. You wanna kind of keep your, um, kind of pull this a little bit tight. You don't want it to get all loose. And then you kind of pull it through like that. You can kind of tighten it up a little bit from the back. So that gives you this cute little knot. And you can arrange these together and make it look like um, like little rosebuds or berries on something. Or um, you could do like a little vine and do these all around it to make it look maybe like, um, like a wheat stalk or some type of a... Usually it looks nice. Um, type of a botanical type look or something, but you could also, um, you could fill in an entire circle with these to make a, some type of a textured piece, or you could line these up and make like writing with these, um, anything you can imagine. I mean, just use your imagination. But with this, you come up from the back, pull your thread all the way through, wrap it twice. Sometimes I get crazy and wrap it a couple of extra times just to make a nice big one. And then you wanna go down, back down through, but you don't wanna go down through the exact same hole or else it'll pull through. 
you want to go like a couple of threads over. You want to kind of keep this pulled a little tight as it's going back down through, and that keeps a nice, neat, kind of a clean knot. And so you can see that one I pulled, I wrapped a couple of extra times, so it got a little bigger. And so I think that's okay. You know, some people might not like it that big, but um, you can see with this variegated yarn, this hand dyed yarn, it looks, you know, kind of like if that were supposed to be like a little flower bud or something then I think that would be real pretty. It kind of gives it that look that it's going to have different shades of pink or purple in it. Any questions about the French knot? Yes, Kathleen wants to know, and this isn't specifically about the French knot, but do you have any tips for threading the needle? Okay, so for threading the needle, I have a little needle threader here. Um, I don't really use, you can buy a commercial needle threader, but I don't usually use it. Um, so here's a commercial needle threader and you put the yarn through there, or you put this through the needle. I have a needle handy. This probably isn't gonna work so well with this big yarn, but you put this through the needle and then you put, that through, and I've broken a lot of these because they, and then you pull it through like that. And that actually worked already. So that's one way of threading a needle. Um, you can also, if, the, if you're using yarn and the eye of the needle is a little bigger, there's different kinds of needle threaders that you can find. Um, but if you have yarn, let's say you've got a, it doesn't have to be a needle this big, but you can take a piece of paper and wrap, but it's kind of like how you would do, a, like how a shoelace is. And then you put that through. And so that makes it easy to thread. Um, you know, there's lots of different ways of threading a needle, but with cruel embroidery though, the, ne the eye of the needle should be big enough for the yarn to go through fairly easily. And if it's not, then I would recommend getting a, a bigger needle if possible. Any other questions? Um, Elise would like to know if French knots and colonial knots are pretty much the same thing. You know, I'm not even sure what a colonial knot is. <laughs> I don't think I've done that before. Is that like something you do in candle wicking or is that? <laughs> um, and Jill wants to know, does it matter if you wrap the yarn slash thread from the front to the back or back to front when making a French knot? Hmm. I always do it this way. So let's try it this way. I'm gonna say it probably technically matters to somebody, but it probably wouldn't matter to me. How's that for an answer? <laughs> I like it. <laughs> And then I don't Janine, think they look any different, but I bet somebody out there would say there's a big difference in it. So it's probably your answer. <laughs> um, Janine says that when she tried the French knot, she ended up with a loop rather than a tight knot. Do you have any? Yeah. So what happens with that is you want to make sure you're kind of keeping it tight. So when you wrap it twice, you do want to make sure you're keeping it tight. You don't want to let it get, you don't want to let a lot of slack in it. So keep it kind of snug, not super tight. And then as you're going back down through your fabric, you want to go like one or two threads over, but you can see how I'm keeping it tight the whole time. I'm kind of keeping that really snug. So you can see, you, you want to kind of hold this working yarn kind of tight. You don't want it let it kind of just get like that and kind of get a lot of slack in it. So keep it tight and then push your needle through and then reach around to the back. But as I'm pulling the needle from the back, I'm keeping this pulled tight. And so that kind of helps to keep it. And I've done that before where I've had slack and with, with a sharper needle and with smaller, I've kind of, I've actually come up sometimes through my knot one more time and kind of 
secured it back down. But that's not gonna work so well with this type. But if you're using a smaller, like a sharper needle and smaller like embroidery floss, I think, I think you can sometimes go back and re-secure it if you need to. But if you keep everything pulled tight from the start, that's the best way. So wrap it twice, keep it tight. So that's probably the best way. Okay. Any other questions? Nope, I think we're good for now. Yeah. So you don't have to just, it, I think technically you just are only supposed to wrap it twice for a French knot, but I'm sometimes I go four or five or six times. Like I like crazy knot sometimes. So I always say, do what you will. This is your piece. This is your, you're creating it. Um, if you do it and it doesn't work out, then you might want to, you know, take it out and rethink it. But don't, I don't think you should ever let anyone tell you you can or cannot do anything a certain way that you should, um, you know, do what you, you go ahead and try it. I don't like to be told what to do. I barely take suggestions, so. Oh, there was one more question asking. I did if... that one I did a whole bunch of times. And it's a nice big knot. I, I would, it didn't secure as well all around. So that might be part of the problem, but I think it would be okay. So you can kind of see that's a much bigger one. What were you saying, Sam? Um, would you recommend using stabilizer while doing embroidery? Um, it depends on the fabric. If you have a nice stiff fabric, uh, you might not need it, but you might want to, you know, it depends. You go ahead and try it if it makes it feel a little bit more comfortable in your hand and it makes your stitches maybe lay a little flatter. You know, it's worth a try. You can certainly do it if you want, or you don't. I don't think technically you normally need it, but there's always, you know, a situation where it might work out and come in handy. Any other questions? Okay, let's see here. So this one I'm going to show you. See, I'm using a double strand here, nice big thick double strand. So you take a stitch, it's almost like you're going to do a like a basting stitch or a running stitch. But then you leave, you kind of leave this big loop here. And then you bring your needle back up through the middle. And then you pull everything tight. And this is the stem stitch. And then you go back down. You kind of always want to keep it the same direction. So you kind of hold that loop open, bring your next stitch up in the center between where you came up and when you went back down. And then close in that loop. Take another stitch. You don't want to pull it completely shut, leave that loop, and then come up. Can you see how I'm doing? Kind of come up. And then tangled up with my other yarn underneath. This is why you want the back to look as good as the front so you don't have had a random needle left under there too because I'm demonstrating. Oh shoot. And this is called the stem stitch. And this just kind of gives you kind of a twisted rope look. Okay, any questions about stem stitch? 
can see I still got these on my thumb. You can, they, it comes in handy if you really want to make sure everything is spaced out evenly, but you don't, I don't usually do that actually, but I like to kind of show a little trick to make things easier for people. Most of my pieces are more free form and I don't really measure things out super close. I kind of like the organic look of it. Okay, so that's stem stage. Anything, any questions about that? And again, that's just an aesthetic. It's just used if you, um, you know, want a certain look. We have a few people asking if you could do it again and possibly in a thinner yarn so it's a little bit easier for them to see. There's a lot of really great tutorials on YouTube. So, and there's so many more stitches. I mean, there's probably thousands of stitches and variations of stitches. These are just the basic beginning ones. And this is a nice one too that you can, most all of these you can do um, change directions or do different shapes or make circles or straight lines or curvy lines. Sorry about these shadows. I was trying a new lighting situation. Usually I just have my window open and use natural light but it's dark outside now early. So I'm just trying with the desk lamp to see and some of the shadows are a little heavy. I need a lighting director. If anyone wants to hire a lighting director to come to my apartment. Okay, so that's the stem stitch and you can really lean it either direction. And it doesn't change. I mean, it, it, they'll either kind of go that way or that way. And it doesn't really affect the look of it so much. It kind of got sloppy right there. But that's the stem stitch. It kind of gives you just like a braided, kind of like a braided look, like a twisted rope kind of a look. Anything else? So I. I have a couple of small little pieces. Like this was just a practice piece that I did just for this class. And um, it's just using the stitches that I did. So like, here's the French knots. So like you can see if you just did like little groups of three of them, it looks like, like I think this looks like buds on a, like a tree branch maybe, or like leaves. Um, here's the basting stitch, just this dashed line right here. This is the whipped basting stitch. So I did a basting stitch with black and then I twisted the blue through it. Right here is a chain stitch. And then this is back stitch. I just did this little vine here in back stitch. Um, what else? I did little X's here. It's basically kind of like a cross stitch, but it's basically just two like straight stitches overlapping each other right there. I don't think I have any stem stitch on here. I have a lot of back stitch because that's my favorite one. But this is just, just real basic. I just kind of drew this out. I didn't even, I just kind of did it as I went. Just kind of did it freehand, which is kind of how I like to do things. But with just the stitches I've showed you today, you could easily, you know, do some kind of a cute little without any kind of, you know, stress. But if you want to buy, um, there's kits available you can buy. I think michaels.com has kits. 
um, that come with all the tools you would need, like the, the yarn and um, trying to read the comments. Sometimes I can see them. Any other questions quickly? We have about five minutes if you want me to go over anything else. Emily would like you to talk a little bit more about what would be the easiest way to transfer a pattern onto the fabric? So there's lots of different ways. Um, probably the easiest way would be to use one of the transfer pencils. Um, so this is a heat, it's a heat transfer pencil. And these are pretty, you can buy these, I think Michael's has them or you can get them online pretty much anywhere. And what you can do is you can just print out a design that you like just you know, from your computer, just find, just Google something or go to Pinterest, print it out, um, enlarge it or make it smaller to the right size that you want it to be for your work. And then you just trace it, you go right over the lines. So the printer printed it out and then you go right over those lines with this um, heat transfer pencil. And then um, you lay that face down onto your fabric. Well, first what you do is you take the iron and you warm up the fabric with the iron. You don't want to use steam, you just want it to be a dry heat. So you warm up the fabric with the iron and then you lay that down face down so that the pencil is on your fabric. And then you iron the back of the paper and you can just, you know, keep pressing it and pressing it and hold it down tight and you can kind of peel up that paper to look and see if it's transferring nicely. Um, and if it's not, you know, go, go over it again where it needs to be. And then when you take that up, if there are any spots that aren't quite perfect, you can go back over it with your pencil or you can then go back over it with one of these disappearing ink pencils. Um, this transfer pencil, I don't think it washes off super easily. So you might wanna consider that depending on the piece. If you're using um, clue embroidery, where you're using a nice thick yarn, then it's gonna cover it up. Um, but if let's say you're doing white work where you're doing like white linen with white red, you might not want to use this because it might show. So there's, depending on the piece that you're using, um, this one's really nice. Um, you can use a shadow box or a window. So if you have a design that you like, um, you can tape that to your window and then you can hold your fabric up over it, um, like on a really sunny, bright day and you can be able to see through it. And then you could trace it with this one. And then if you mess up or um, if, if it shows through, then if, as soon as it gets wet, it'll disappear. Um, you might want to do a little test on your fabric before you start just to make sure, um, but it, it works really well, um, depending, I guess, depending on the name brand of the pen. Um, you can print out designs on a transfer paper and then iron those directly onto your fabric as well. Or you can just draw it freehand. Usually I just draw things on freehand, but I know that's not for everybody. Any other questions? And there's, there's videos online on how to do this. Um, you can just search for um, transfer images for embroidery on YouTube and it'll bring up all kinds of options for you. So there's always information to be had. Um, we did get a couple of questions about how you would tack down your yarn at the end once you've finished your embroidery. So at the end, um, let's see, pull this through. So I kind of made a mess back here. I kind of got it all. So the way I do it, and again, I really don't like, you could just tie a knot, but how I would do it, I would just kind of, and I'm not piercing my fabric. I'm just kind of going under the stitches. needle came undone. So, but you would just want to go under your stitches kind of like that a couple of times and then go back the other direction. Um, let me get this threaded again. Or I could do it with the brown. So, um, so I would just kind of take it kind of like back through these stitches like this. You want to make sure you're not pulling it or disturbing the front of it at all. And then kind of go back the other direction. 
And another thing you could, if you're worried about it, you could put a little, um, a little drop of the fray, no fray kind of fabric glue on a, on the drop of on your end, but I don't think that's really necessary. Um, and then just cut it. So go about one inch, maybe two inches, and then back just to make sure it's really nice and secure. That's how I would do it. And then after you do that, if you want to tie a little knot, you can just to kind of give yourself extra peace of mind. But that would work. Great. Um, I just popped the handout into the chat one more time before we go. I know a few people on mobile were having trouble accessing it. Um, if you reply to the confirmation email from this class and let us know that you need the link, we'll send that right over to you. If you want to watch this class again, this recording will be available on michaels.com slash classes and on their YouTube channel tomorrow. It will be up on their YouTube channel for a very long time. So you can go to YouTube and save it to your own playlist and then you can watch it whenever you need it. Um, you can also save the chat. We have some classes coming up in December. We have the basics of felting on December 7th and Fair Isle Knitting on December 14th. Those are available to sign up for at michaels.com slash classes. And I will add Darren's social media handles into the chat so you can find him. And thanks everybody. Yeah, if you have any questions, um, don't hesitate to contact me on either Instagram Probably Instagram is the best one to contact me. I'm also on TikTok, but um, yeah, Sam's going to put it in. It's Mr. Wooly Bear, if you want to look for it. Let me know if you have questions. I can usually answer questions pretty quick um, or and then sometimes direct you to other videos or something for more help. So just let me know if you need any help.